The Nazis became famous not only for their anti-Semitic doctrine and the genocide of six million Jews, but for the effectiveness with which they carried it out. In that deadly, racist, and bloodthirsty clockwork scheme, a heavily ideological and spectacularly trained military body was fundamental. We are talking about the Waffen-SS, a military force that directly answered to the Fuhrer. They were elite commandos, ready to carry out the most atrocious missions perpetrated by the Third Reich. In today's video, we will explain how the SS were structured, what requirements were needed to join them, and who their leader was, among other chilling details. Prepare yourselves for a journey into the depths of the most efficient and organized monster within the Nazi ranks to truly understand the terror from within. Welcome once again to military history. In the dizzying scenario of the Second World War, the Schutzstaffel, known as the SS, emerged as an ominous entity amidst history. Established in the early days of the Third Reich, these paramilitary forces embodied the very essence of National Socialism, bearing the emblem of the intertwined double S as a sinister oath. From their genesis, the SS took on various forms, from the feared Gestapo, which was the manager of fear and internal repression, to the Waffen-SS, the military branch deployed as a sharp spearhead on the battlefronts. Aesthetically recognizable by their dark uniforms, these soldiers became the personification of the brutal authority of the regime. However, beyond uniformity, the SS were the minds behind dark ideologies. Hitler, with his distorted vision, shaped soldiers not only for combat, but also for fanatical devotion to the cause of the Reich. The indoctrination, as essential as physical training, cemented loyalty to the Aryan race and ruthless savagery at the core of the SS. The iconography, from the skulls on their uniforms to the tattoos of soldiers' blood groups marked on their bodies, created an indelible image in history. Not only were they terrible, but they made sure to be visually memorable and terrifying to the enemy and to history. The testimonies that have emerged from those who lived under the command of the SS are truly chilling. The soldiers, marked by forced loyalty and systematic cruelty, left accounts that paint a grim picture of life within the ranks. Versuchen sich vorzustellen, da ist ein Graben. Da stehen Menschen an einer Seite und dahinter stehen Soldaten. Das waren wir und die haben geschossen. Und die getroffen wurden, die sind runtergefallen. As we delve into the intriguing world of weapons used during that turbulent historical period, we find that in terms of their arsenal, they did not deviate significantly from the military standard. In the clutches of the Waffen-SS were deposited tools that would become icons of the Second World War. In the realm of handguns, the Luger P08 stood out, recognized for its elegant design and battlefield effectiveness. And the Walther P38, a highly accurate semi-automatic pistol that earned its place among elite soldiers. As for rifles, the imposing presence of the Mauser Carabiner 98K resonated on the battlefields. This bolt-action rifle, known for its reliability and unfailing accuracy, stood as the loyal companion of Waffen SS fighters, adding to this repertoire the MP38 and MP40 submachine guns nicknamed Schmeisser on the front lines, earned their reputation as compact and lethal weapons in close combat. Third careful selection of this equipment reflected the efficiency and lethality sought by the Waffen-SS in their operations. In the hands of these disciplined soldiers, these weapons were not just tools of war, but a manifesto of their will to eradicate the inferior race. The belief that each militia of these troops was a unique specimen of the human species, was not only an ideological delusion, but was cemented in the selection of the best men for this elite military force. The Waffen-SS formed their ranks with criteria, as rigorous as they were discriminatory, as recruits for this force were not just soldiers, they were selected guardians of a distorted ideology. 
The idea was that these men would shape the Germany of the future, as described by this specialist in a documentary. Las SS iban a ser el clero del nuevo Reich, del Reich de los mil años. Ellos eran las personas que iban a estar a cargo de la ideología y la pureza ideológica del Estado. The entrance requirements were a portal to a world marked by fanatical devotion and ferocity, unleashed by the belief in a genetically superior being. For selection, it was fundamental to be affiliated with the Nazi party, to have a deep connection with the precepts of Nazism, and to feel an unwavering commitment to the cause. But the filter didn't stop there. Young men between 17 and 22 years old were sought, physically fit, with a minimum height of 1.75 meters, thus embodying Hitler's vision of racial superiority. Aryan perfection became an unavoidable requirement for applicants. At least two generations of pure ancestry in the candidate's genealogical tree were demanded. In various selection tests, candidates had to demonstrate a physical state bordering on impeccable, a reflection of the perfect body that Hitler imagined as the essence of his elite army. Initially, when the war had not yet plunged into total chaos, admission was voluntary and only 15% of applicants managed to cross the threshold. But with the urgency of the conflict, the doors opened more widely although the selection process maintained its unyielding pulse. Recruits, mostly from Hitler Youth, were subjected to even deeper ideological indoctrination. More than soldiers, they were shaped as ambassadors of the new Nazi order, bearers of a mission that went beyond the borders of the battlefield. Thus, the recruitment requirements of the Waffen-SS were not only a selection protocol, but the meticulous construction of a cast of soldiers who would embody the darkest and most discriminatory vision of history. This process forged the foundations of a force extremely feared by friend and foe alike, whose truculent forms and sinister deeds marked German military history with blood. The man responsible behind the scaffolding of these elite troops was as wicked as the men he directed. Among the most prominent figures of the Third Reich, there stood out a perverse figure that personified the heart of repression and cruelty. Heinrich Himmler stood as a diabolical puppet master, manipulating the strings of racial obsession and unrestrained brutality. Himmler, a man with an apparently harmless appearance with his glasses and serene demeanor, was the embodiment of evil disguised as bureaucracy. As Reichsfuhrer SS, his influence transcended military boundaries and spread like a toxic web infiltrating every aspect of the Nazi machinery becoming Adolf Hitler's private advisor. Under his command, the SS became Hitler's preferred tool for the execution of his delusional plans for racial cleansing. Himmler was the architect of the Holocaust and devised the final solution, an abomination that would seal the fate of millions of innocent Jews. His mastermind designed the system of concentration and extermination camps where human suffering became commonplace but this man was not only the executioner in the shadows, but also a fanatic ideologue. Obsessed with creating a pure Aryan race, he directed inhuman experiments in search of genetic perfection. The twilight of the war did not stop Himmler's machinery. In his final days, he tried to negotiate peace with the Allies, seeking an exit for himself. Betraying Hitler himself showed that he had no principles at all. But justice finally caught up with this architect of horror in May 1945, when he was captured by Allied forces. In his hands, the SS transformed into a diabolical force that left indelible scars on the memory of the 20th century. Let's review some of the atrocities carried out by these ruthless troops. The brutalities committed by the SS manifested in systematic savagery and heartless cruelty. From the invasion of Poland in 1939 to their torturous presence in concentration and extermination camps, their bloody footprint spread across Europe like a dark specter. In the occupied territories, the SS carried out massive, indiscriminate, and often grotesque executions. Entire villages were decimated, while women, children, and the elderly fell victim to the relentless machinery of repression. Mass executions, rapes, 
and indiscriminate destruction left behind a trail of desolation and despair. Let us hear the testimony of a surviving officer. Die waren ja dermaßen geschockt und verängstigt. Mit denen konnten sie machen, was sie wollten. But it was in the concentration camps where the SS reached the pinnacle of atrocity. Auschwitz, Sobibor, Treblinka, three proper names that resonate with the echo of inhumanity. Under Himmler's direction, the SS orchestrated the Holocaust, a genocide that sought the systematic annihilation of millions of people, mainly Jews and Romani, to purify the German race. Survivors' testimonies paint an unimaginable picture of horror. Aberrant medical experiments, inhuman tortures, and gas chambers that became customary amid the most appalling barbarism. Dehumanization reached unprecedented levels. The death machinery of the SS operated with mechanical efficiency, eliminating tens of thousands of prisoners in periods of less than a day. Many of the responsible individuals still show no signs of remorse, as evidenced by the following testimony of a former combatant. Stalinistischer Bolschewismus und haben versucht, unser Land davor zu schützen und vor allen Dingen vielleicht ganz Europa. Wenn wir den Bolschewismus nicht aufgehalten hätten, dann wäre er auch über ihr Land gekommen und vielleicht nach Frankreich und so weiter. Some of the leading figures of this force emerged as sinister shadows that transcended the brutality of the conflict. From charismatic leaders to ruthless commanders, these personalities left an indelible mark on history, embodying the face of a racist and ruthless ideology, in addition to their Machiavellian leader Himmler, who sowed the seeds of hatred and violence. Other proper names also stood out in this elite corps, known as the Blonde Beast. Reinhard Heydrich, was the architect of the Night of the Long Knives and also one of the main ideologues of Nazism. His cruelty unleashed itself as a relentless display of repression, and his figure left an indelible scar on the history of the SS, instilling terror in both enemies and within the ranks. On the military front, Joachim Piper embodied the fiery youth of the Waffen-SS. At 29, he led armored units fiercely on the Eastern Front. His audacity in battle and blind loyalty made him an icon but also a controversial figure due to his role in the Malmedy Massacre during the Battle of the Bulge. Kurt Meyer, nicknamed Panzer for his tactical prowess with armored tank divisions, stood out as a bold leader on the front lines. His skill in blitzkrieg warfare catapulted him to prominence, but his unwavering loyalty to the SS also embroiled him in controversies and trials after the war. He always denied his responsibility in the events and claimed to be following orders and defending his country. On the Eastern Front, Hans Ulrich Rudel was known as the Iron Knight. As a Stuka pilot, he destroyed over 500 enemy tanks and became the only soldier in the force to receive the Knight's Cross with oak leaves, swords, and diamonds. His bravery in battle earned him respect even from his enemies, although his military legacy was tainted with inhumanity and racism. They were crusaders of an ideology, as pointed out by this specialist. Había una ceremonia de coronación, un ritual como se hacía con los caballeros en la época medieval. Pero un oficial de las SS, el caballero moderno, el caballero teutónico moderno, recibía su anillo, recibía su insignia. These figures, among many others, generated a dark and complex narrative in the history of the Waffen SS. When one thinks of the Nazis, the focus is often on this elite military body but there were other militias that were just as terrible and efficient as these sinister soldiers. On the battlefields of World War II, two German forces stood out with ferocity and tactical skill. In addition to the SS, there were the Heer, the prestigious ground forces of the Wehrmacht, the name given to the unified armed forces of Nazi Germany. These two entities, while sharing the same purpose of defending the Nazi machinery, were distinguished by their unique characteristics, forging divergent paths in military history. The Heer, or here in German, represented the backbone of the Wehrmacht. They comprised infantry, artillery, armored units, and all ground branches, 
that constituted the bulk of the war machine. Infused with the spirit of Blitzkrieg, the Hare launched lightning offensives that surprised and overwhelmed their enemies. With a more conventional structure, the Hur recruited soldiers from all spheres of German society. While they did not possess the same level of Nazi fanaticism as the Waffen-SS, they earned a reputation for military discipline, solid tactics, and determination in combat. Their presence was constant on European fronts, from the deserts of North Africa to the forests of the Soviet Union. On the other hand, the Waffen-SS were the cream of the crop of the Nazi army, their black uniform and the famous SS runes became synonymous with unrestrained brutality, although later in the war they abandoned aesthetic pretensions and dressed similarly to the hair, however. They never abandoned their logo of the two lightning S's and the fearsome skull that identified them. The relationship between these two entities was complex. While they shared the same purpose of serving the Third Reich, their differences in terms of recruitment, ideology, and combat tactics generated tensions within the Reich, especially because Himmler believed that the SS were much more valuable and necessary for the future of an Aryan Germany than the common soldiers of the RR. Meanwhile, Adolf Hitler wove his hegemonic vision of an unstoppable Third Reich. To carry out his dreams of conquest and supremacy, the Fuhrer not only relied on the Wehrmacht, but also trusted that his elite force would embody his fanatic ideals. The Chancellor saw the Waffen-SS not only as a military force but as the very embodiment of his racial and political vision for the nation's prosperous future. Hitler considered the SS the vanguard of his projection of a new world order. Through a rigorous recruitment process, selecting pure Aryans and devout fanatics, Hitler aspired to forge a force that would not only be feared on the battlefield, but would also inspire terror in the hearts of those who resisted Nazism. The dictator and his regime intended for these men to reshape the human race across the globe with racial superiority in their blood and a swastika in their hearts. Las SS no iban a ser solo una organización política, ellos iban a ser una nueva orden de caballeros. Tenían la idea de que ellos iban a ser los jefes del mundo. Para ser un caballero de la SS había que demostrar la pureza racial. Ultimately, the Hare and the Waffen SS, each in their own way, left an indelible scar on the battlefields and extermination camps of World War II. Their intertwined and conflicting stories narrate the complexity and brutality of a conflict that changed the course of history. The Nuremberg trials cataloged the SS as a criminal organization that violated human rights in ways never before seen. So the stain of their crimes persists in the collective memory of the German people. The hatred inoculated by the Nazi propaganda apparatus generated men who were willing to kill a compatriot over a racial issue. This is not just a theory, but it became flesh in individuals, as shown in the following testimony. Das war die einzige Überlegung. Während ja. der ganzen Zeit haben sie keinerlei Gefühl für die Leute gehabt und die jüdischen Zivilisten, die sie erschossen haben. Nein. Und warum nicht? Dazu ist mein Hass den Juden gegenüber zu groß. The military elite during the Nazi regime were banished from German society for the infamy of their actions. The history of their war crimes is a chilling reminder of how far evil can go when an ideology based on racial superiority seizes an armed and specialized militia. In the depths of this history lies the urgency to remember, to learn from the horrors of the past, to build a future where humanity does not succumb again to racist and fanatical barbarism. During World War II, the Red Army of the Soviet Union was considered a powerful machine of muscle, blood and metal that had the ability to collide face to face with Hitler's soldiers and that pushed the Fuhrer to his lair where, already cornered, he took his own life. Although after this historic conflict the Soviet forces enjoyed greater infamy, becoming the potential enemy of the United States and NATO, it is undeniable that from their creation until their disappearance they have represented one of the most feared armies on earth. The truth is that, if we carefully review the history of the Red Army, we'll find stories of enormous feats or masterful strategies, 
even in situations where they had everything to lose. But we'll also find a very extensive amount of errors, insufficiencies, and mistakes. Many historians single out Soviet generals for being ruthless, while others call them butchers, willing to sacrifice endless numbers of their soldiers simply for whatever combat tactics they thought fit. However, this could also be said of the American strategy in Normandy, or the one carried out by Germany when it invaded the Soviet Union, and which ended with its largest army decimated. All these contradictions lead us to ask ourselves, what was the training and preparation of the Red Army soldiers like? When we talk about World War II and the role that the forces of the former Soviet Union played during the conflict, we must take into account several factors. To begin with, it is important to note that the training of the troops was really very varied. In some battles, soldiers who had prepared before 1940 participated, while, after the invasion by the Germans of the communist cities, in many cases the soldiers were recruited, armed, and sent to war practically without training. In a third instance, after the recapture of territory taken by Hitler and before advancing on Berlin, most of Stalin's corps were made up of a mixture of rookies and surviving veterans. In its origins, traceable to the October Revolution of 1917, the Red Army was called the Red Guard, and was a militia made up of armed workers, with a smaller number of military or police officers who had joined the Communist Party. It was born under its official name in 1918, under the command of the People's Commissar for War, Leon Trotsky, who indoctrinated new recruits from the outset to serve both the motherland and Lenin's socialist dream. But the great crisis caused by the civil war in Russia meant that, by 1925, there were just over half a million troops at the service of the country. Although the Soviets tried to contain the loss of soldiers by integrating the most hard-working forces and militant movements, they had to sign a secret treaty with Germany in which cross-training of troops was established. By this point, the Soviets had run out of their military hotbed, the death of Lenin and the exile of Trotsky put the communist military establishment in crisis, and the need for officers led to military careers being reduced to a minimum, which was of two years, whereas, in the past, just the arms career lasted three years. Worse still, shortly after graduation, officers were promoted in rank, which lowered the overall quality of lieutenants and admirals. This problem deepened enormously in 1937, the year in which Stalin, distrusting the military institutions of his government, carried out the Great Military Purge. In a single year, the imprisonment and, in some cases, the execution of 30,000 officers, including senior army officials, were ordered. When the Germans invaded the Soviet Union, they found a country devoid of military positions, without decision-making and with power centralized in the figure of Stalin, who turned out to be a neophyte in war matters. Communist troops were poorly prepared, poorly fed, and poorly equipped. Although the uniform they wore was the traditional one, in many cases they had to carry old rifles, from the First World War or the Revolutionary Period. As Germany advanced on the various Soviet cities, those veteran soldiers who had received formal training before 1941 began to die, and Stalin organized a general levy for the young Soviets to defend the nation. At that time a dark joke arose among the soldiers, take this stick, now go die for the motherland. Although today it is known that this was not the case, in a way it reflects what young Russians felt when they were recruited to protect their land. They were quickly trained in two months, trying to assimilate both basic concepts and fundamental or complex lessons as fast as possible. In a few days they were trained in shooting, military strategy and survival, among others. This generated two serious problems. The first was that the recruits had not really finished incorporating any of the new knowledge, and they lacked practice in the field. The second involved gross disobedience to the chain of command, or the inability to follow orders in a martial manner, which not only led to difficulties in operations, but also led many generals to look down on their own men and deliberately put their lives on the line. For all his power and dictatorial style, Stalin could not take his eyes off the problem he himself had created so he decided to pardon some of the officers he had imprisoned during the Great Purge. Some 5,000 men, who had been lucky enough to go to prison rather than be executed by their own soldiers, returned to the army to restore the missing order. 
Added to this was the growing presence of Marshal Zhukov in decision-making. Zhukov shown in his role as organizer of the defense in Moscow, which proved relatively effective but culminated in a successful counteroffensive that devastated the German invaders. After this, he would be remembered as a butcher who was willing to give the life of every last one of his men as long as his strategy worked. The reason behind this terrible fame lies in two operations that he himself promoted, the capture of the German 6th Army in Stalingrad, which lasted months and cost the lives of millions of Soviets, and the infamous Operation Mars. On this mission, Zhukov personally led the attack on Hitler's troops, who had fled Stalingrad and were taking refuge in Rezev. After the offensive, 70,000 Soviets had been killed, and 134,000 had been wounded. On the German side, casualties reached 40,000, despite the fact that their strength was almost a third that of the Soviets. After recovering from the blows Hitler dealt the Soviet Union, the Red Army regained its composure. Several more marshals became involved in offensive decision-making, slightly displacing Zhukov. One of the most effective decisions was to combine the battalions so that they were composed of inexperienced recruits and surviving veterans of the defense. In this way, the troops had both strength and experience, while order in the ranks and respect for the generals were more easily maintained. Once again confronting his ineptitude, Stalin allowed his generals to recover the original strategic forms, which had been proposed at the time of the revolution, and decided to stop intervening directly in operations. The change caused by the dictator's withdrawal from the strategy table brought a devastated Red Army to the doors of the Third Reich Chancellery, while several meters below ground, Hitler put a gun to his head, surrounded by his worst enemies. Thank you very much for joining us until the end. And stay tuned for our next video.